Hello everyone, welcome to another installment of All Things Berlin. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'm the host of the podcast Talking Tudors, where uh, throughout May we've been celebrating and exploring all things Berlin. And this theme will actually continue next month as well. And I'm very thrilled that for our first video chat, joining us today is Professor Susanna Lipscomb. Welcome, Susanna. Thank you. I'm really pleased to be here. I'm very honoured that I'm your first video chat. Yes, I know. It's <laughs> so exciting, all this new technology we're all using. So, Susanna, before we start, maybe you could just introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about your background. Okay. So, I'm a 16th century historian. Um, I teach at the University of Roehampton, uh, where I'm a professor, as you said, and I've written books about Henry VIII um, and about women in the 16th century and about witchcraft. Um, so I've written about 1536 is the year that changed Henry VIII, um, a book called the, the King is Dead, which looks at Henry, the last years, last days of Henry VIII's life and his last will and testament, and one called Visitor's Companion to Tudor England, which um, obviously needs to go hand in hand with um, any you know, Tudor trail books that you can find um, <laughs> by, you know, people we won't name. But um, basically, if you hold uh, a couple of these different volumes hand in hand here, I've got, you know, the footsteps of Anne Boleyn or others like that, then... Um, uh, and with the visitor's companion, you can go across uh, England and find all the places which have good continuing Tudor significance. Yeah, definitely. And um, I love all your books. I have them all here and they're all wonderful. So I recommend those. Uh, I was just mentioning to you well, earlier. Yeah, mutual, I, mutual, uh, mutual affection there. <laughs> oh, thank, you, thank you. When I uh, mentioned on our Talking Tutors Facebook group and on my Instagram account that we were going to have a chat and then you were so kindly going to answer some questions about Anne Boleyn, I was absolutely inundated with questions. <laughs> so I just want to say to our listeners and our viewers, if we don't get through everything, I apologise. Um, we'll do our best. I don't want to keep Susanna up all night, so we'll see how we go. But we'll dive right in. So first question, and I suppose most people that have been exploring Anne's life for a little while now know that the, um, her date of birth is a hotly debated topic. So Massa would love to know, Susanna, what, what do you think about this? Do you think 1501 is more, you know, circa 1501 or circa 1507? So, um, for those who are new to the question, the, the reason we don't know when she was born, which seems incredible to mm. us, is the fact that from 1538 onwards, parish registers are kept, which recorded baptisms, marriages and deaths, which is the closest we're going to get to recording the date of birth um, for quite some time. Um, but that kind of gathering of civic information didn't happen before that point. And so whether we know someone's birthday or not depended on whether their parents wrote it down or, you know, it was, it was considered a significance to write down. And quite often it would be the names, uh, the dates of the births of heirs, i.e. the boys who would be written down and not the girls. So Anne Boleyn's birthday was not written down and we can only kind of deduce it by when her brother was born. Um, my instinct is very much for the earlier date, which means that she was born in at Blickling Hall as opposed to at Hever Castle. Um, and my the reason for that, because there's not a lot of evidence, let's be frank, either way, but the reason for that is about the fact that we have um, a letter from Anne from 1513 when um, she has become, she's been sent to, um, to be finished really uh, on the continent. And she's let, sent a letter back uh, in French, um, which is uh, which is actually very nice hand, uh, very nice handwriting. But the sort of French it is, I mean, it, it's not just that the spelling is unorthodox, which and phonetic, which is quite common in the 16th century. It's also that the French itself is unlearned. It's not, um, uh, but it's not. On the other hand. Um, so it's, in other words, it's by her, it's not written by a scribe, but on the other hand, it's not written by a, a, like somebody who's just turned six. Yeah. It's really not <laughs> written by a six year old. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, it feels very difficult to, to make any other claim apart from, you know, she's 12 or something when she's writing that, so. Yeah, for what it's worth, I completely agree with you. I think <laughs> having seen, you know, being a teacher for a long time, having seen um, students that are highly gifted and talented, I think just the, the fine motor skills you know, six-year-old, that's going to be pushing it, I think. So I agree with you. Uh, Jess wants to know, 
do we have any idea of what Anne thought of Catherine of Aragon before Henry began to show an interest in her? And this again comes down just to the question of evidence. Mm. The answer basically is no. Um, and that's because um, because an ordinary woman at the court who, the, you know, it was not known at that point, it didn't have the value of hindsight, they didn't know she'd one day be Queen of England and her views might be considered important, or they, maybe they wouldn't have even thought that at the time. Um, yeah, so we, we just don't have the recollections of what many ordinary women thought. Um, uh, and Anne was unusual among women at this time in that she was literate. We have anything from her, that we have that letter from 1513 is highly unusual in terms of establishing a picture of, of a woman at that time and says something about her education and her upbringing. Um, and, but um, no, we don't, you know, no. <laughs> I mean, I imagine, I imagine, um, you know, that she was flattered to be part of the Queen's Court when she came back to England, but in terms of actual evidence, no. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because even in that letter that you just mentioned, she does say that she's looking forward to serving the Queen, but we don't know which Queen she's talking about either, because it could yeah. have been Mary and um, Henry's sister. So. And, it, and it could well, and it could have been Mary, and in, in the end, it, you know, it actually turns out to be Claude uh, well, of France <laughs> that for a long period of time. But yeah, I think you're right. I think it's probably Mary. Yeah, exactly. Gosh. And another, you know, this is why I think Anne's so fascinating. There's so much that we kind of wonder and, and aren't sure about. So Marty would like to know, which portrait do you believe best represents Anne? Yeah, another, uh, <laughs> you know, can of worms, because the, the one that best represents her is the only one that was produced in her lifetime, which is, um, I'm just telling Natalie things that she knows isn't entirely off my heart, but, but which <laughs> is, of course, the, the medal from 1534. Um, and um, so it's in the British Museum. It's only actually about this big. I've, um, you know, I've held it. And um, so what's interesting about it is it's slightly damaged. It's slightly damaged nose, um, but you can see the kind of oval face, long nose. She's wearing a gable hood. Um, and um, so the gable hoods are the ones that look like little bird houses. And uh, in the sort of Henry VII's reign in the late 15th century, they'd had these long, lappets either side but by this point are pinned up as the fashion is the english fashion and they cover all of the hair whereas Anne famously um introduces the fashion of the french hood into the english court um i mean maybe it's around a bit before but you know she makes it popularizes it at least and that is sexier because it shows uh, the center part it shows a bit of hair you know a bit of frisson there um and um so she's not wearing her famous French hood, however, she is wearing a gable hood. Uh, and in fact, but, but she, you know, we do know that she did wear them. She actually wore one to her execution, for example. Yeah. Um, uh, and it, it accords with what we do know about her in descriptions of her having this oval face. Um, it, the, the written descriptions actually talk about her having dark hair and dark eyes and the long neck, dark flashing eyes. I think she, you know, she was obviously a woman of great charisma and that was really carried through her eyes. She wasn't a woman of great beauty by the standards of the time because uh, at the standards of the time, pale skin, she had quite sort of slightly tan skin, yeah. um, pale skin, blonde hair, blue eyes. You know, I would have been fine. Yeah, you would have been <laughs> but, uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, although I've had a little, far too much sun damage in my ears, but um, <laughs> Uh, but you know, whereas Anne was, you know, this dark flashing, flashing eyes, and um, the only uh, written description also says that her bosom was not. Well, one of the written descriptions says her bosom was not much raised, and they very much are in this in this metric. But that could be, sure she was okay. to be pregnant, mm -hmm. you know, um, who knows? Anyway, that's kind of interesting, sort of beside the point. But um, so that's the best likeness of her, and of course, it has some similarities to the pictures we know so well, where she, she is wearing a French hood, where she is wearing her famous necklace from the late 16th century. But they are all. Um, they're all, you know, maybe copies of a lost original, but they're definitely painted after her lifetime. Um, and they're probably, let's be honest, made a little bit prettier than, mm -hmm. you know, they could, you know, they necessarily should have been because her daughter was on the throne and, you know, and you want, one wanted to sort of be pleasing to the queen. So I'm going to have to go with the metal, um, yeah. that sort of medallion, uh, because that's that, that's the only one from her lifetime even though I know it's a bit disappointing as an answer. Yeah, yeah, thank you, great. Now, Kimberly would like to know, do you think that Anne refused to become Henry's mistress because she craved power and had her eyes set on the crown or was it something else? 
Well, there's also another school of thought that says that, um, which is George Bernard's line, that actually it's a choice that Henry and Anne make together, uh, which is that they refuse, that they decide not to consummate their relationship um, and to wait to such a time as they are legally married, or at least by their definition. Um, because obviously they, if we calculate back from when Elizabeth is born, they don't actually quite wait till they're legally married. Um, so, I mean, I, my instinct about this is um, that perhaps at first it's a bit of a power play, but I don't suppose at first she thinks that she's going to become queen, but, but it gives her a bit more control over him. Um, but that actually it becomes a kind of decided policy between them once they are really serious about each other because it means that if they have a child together that child needs to be born um, in a clearly legitimate marriage for that child to become an heir and that really is a significant part of the point as far as Henry's concerned right and it's a significant part of what Anne is promising that there's going to be a male heir so there's sort of no point in muddying the waters. Um, you know, this is like, we just have to remember uh, that there is just no reliable contraception at the time, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that the withdrawal method has been failing Catholics for centuries. You know, it's like, it just, it just, there, there's nothing you can do to prevent yourself getting pregnant. Mm -hmm. And actually the chances of her getting pregnant I mean, there are things you can try, but they're probably not effective, right? So the thing that the, it, getting, her getting pregnant is going to make it almost impossible for them to, uh, to marry um, without there being a massive stain on their reputation. So I think it becomes a decided policy, basically, in the longer term. Another really tricky one here, Susanna, one that people have been arguing about for centuries, multiple people i didn't even write a name because there was that many people <laughs> you think anne and henry's love was genuine and if so what on earth happened <laughs> <laughs> right okay <laughs> where do we start um okay so yes i do think it was genuine i mean we look at what henry did in order to be with anne Boleyn. He uh, moved to heaven and earth. He dismantled the faith of the country. You know, he changed the very religion of England. Um, he put aside his um, really long suffering, uh, incredible wife, Catherine of Aragon, in order to, uh, to, to be with Anne, because that's how much he loved her. You look at the evidence in his letters, this is a man who's clearly infatuated. I mean, absolutely, you know, head over heels in love. Um, we know so much less about Anne's feelings by, com by complete accident of history. Um, and so much gets written into that accident, actually. Because her letters to him don't survive, it's often painted as a picture of just being his love towards her, like he's coming on strong and maybe she's playing a bit hard to get, all that sort of stuff. But frankly, that's just writing into absence of evidence right we don't know what she felt her letters back could have been just as uh, as full of affection and desire as his you know mm -hmm. and i suspect they probably were so i think it is a genuine love and my reading of the evidence which is different to some other historians but my reading of the evidence is that it's not a love that faded um despite what happens to her in the end um so I think that they had the sort of love, um, you know, where they would they would come to rupture quite easily. They were quite they were we know that they would have arguments, but that they would repair rupture and repair. You know, it was this kind of um, rhythm of their relationship, um, and so it was a bit tempestuous by comparison to sort of a more you know calm um, love affair, uh, which had you know gone its course. And I think it's still like that towards the end. Um, and I think it's only because of that that Henry can come to believe, which is what I think he did, that he came to believe that Anne had done this extraordinarily awful thing, that she had betrayed him with five men, including her brother, that all this time when he had done everything for her and he had thought that she loved him as he loved her, she had been cheating on him in the most awful way. And I think it's only that depth of emotion um, that can explain what happened because, you know, hate 
um, it, it is, is part of love. You know, hate is not the op opposite of love. Indifference is the opposite of love. What Henry felt for Anne at the end was hatred because he loved her so much. Mm. I like that rupture and repair. That's really, yeah, it's a really interesting answer. Thank you, Susanna. So Laura would like to know, in reference to Anne believing or implying that she would give Henry son and heirs as she did in her um, book of hours, etc. Did Anne believe it was part of her destiny to give Henry a son or was it more insecure boasting to reassure Henry in his decisions and secure her position as queen? So that was Laura's question. I'm not sure that there necessarily has to be um, a contradiction or a tension between those two things. I think that she could have come to believe that this is what she was destined to do mm -hmm. at the same time as obviously promising. I mean, we, no one can know that they're going to have a son <laughs> rather than a daughter. Um, and um, as it turned out, if she had, you know, she wasn't right. Um, yeah. But if she did come to believe it, but the, you know, I, so I think, but, but she obviously, she obviously was sufficiently convinced of or, or had convinced herself um, and, you know, uh, and I do think that probably was something that she believed. Um, but at the same time, that doesn't mean she didn't ham it up for the purposes of converting Henry to her cause. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Elizabeth. Um, what does Elizabeth ask? Let's see. This is something that's always bothered Elizabeth, she says. When Cranmer visited her in the tower, so visited Anne in the tower, she signed away her position as queen. Therefore, if she was no longer legally queen and no longer regarded as Henry's wife, on what grounds was she to be executed for adultery? Yes, Elizabeth, you have spotted the absolute major hole in the whole thing. Completely and utterly. How, how can you both be guilty of adultery and not have been married to him? These two things are incompatible. <laughs> um, uh, you're absolutely right. And it, made no, it makes no legal sense. Um, it's not actually why she dies, though the adultery. I don't think, but um, but I think what you're but what you're saying is is completely true. It's a defence mechanism, though. It's a way of um, making sure that Elizabeth isn't you know his daughter by her at that time. He hasn't realised how valuable she's going to be. He has it you know later that year he puts her out of the line of succession. She's you know she's declared illegitimate. It makes her illegitimate because the marriage hasn't really existed as a marriage and I think actually there's something more important psychologically going on as well because of course famously at um, George Boleyn Lord Rochford's trial he had declared that Anne had talked of the fact that Henry um, was not skillful in copulating with a woman and had neither uh, vigour nor potency um, and I think that um, <sighs> When we come to Henry's marriage to Anne of Cleves, one of the sort of themes that, that comes out of that is that Henry's saying that he can't do it because he has, um, you know, these kind of scruples of conscience about whether she's actually married to someone else, in this case, Francis, the Duke of Lorraine. And um, there's something implied there about if, you know, if, if Henry's uh, sexual performance is going to be questioned in any way, let's have something to blame it on if that comes you know so I, you know I, I we weren't really married so you know I my conscience <laughs> wouldn't let me perform the act I think that that might be underlining it as well frankly right yeah bit of saving face and his honor, mm -hmm. his honor. yeah great okay so this is another one where multiple people ask this so I apologize for not naming people um and you've kind of touched on this a little bit already do you believe that Henry wanted to get rid of Anne did he truly believe she was guilty and this one we could probably spend, I don't know, three weeks talking about Susanna. What part do you think Thomas Cromwell played in Anne's downfall? Yeah, okay. <laughs> How long have you got? Um, okay, so there are, let's just really be, there are four basic camps on Anne's um, death. So there's the sort of camp that says that she was guilty. Um, which is most uh, significantly represented by Professor George Bernard. So he says, well, in the end he says, well, we can't prove that she was guilty, but let's give her the Scottish verdict of um, not proven. You know, we can't prove that she was innocent either. Um, and, uh, you know, he thinks there's no smoke without fire. 
Then there's the camp that think that then everybody else kind of basically believes that she's innocent in terms of the accusations made against her. Hmm. Um, but there are those who think that it was a coup caused by Thomas Cromwell. Uh, Eric Ives was the great uh, exponent of this, Press Eric Ives, um, who, who suggested that Henry could be bounced into action when the time was right, and that, that uh, Cromwell does this because of disagreements with Anne about things like um, the money for the monasteries, the dissolution of the monasteries, and matters of foreign policy, whether they're pro France or pro empire. Um, then uh, you have those who think it um, emanates all from Henry. And um, David Starkey, for example, David, David Starkey suggests that um, that you know it's off with her head. <laughs> uh, from Henry's point of view, that he's tired of her abrasive character, that you know he's you know wants to move on. Um, and the fourth point of view, which is the one that I subscribe to, is the one that was best outlined by Greg Walker. Um, it is Professor Greg Walker. I'm giving everyone their titles tonight. Um, so, which is suggests that actually it's not what Anne did that made her appeal guilty, but what she said. That in many ways, what Anne, um, how she acted was um, as required, and I've, I've sort of looked into this with regards to ideas about gender roles at the time. So she was required to act as the kind of queen bee at the center of a courtly love court. Mm -hmm. But that meant, uh, and it's exactly what attracted Henry to her, her ability in, in this sort of word, love word play, you know, um, but it also meant that she said things that were flirtatious, that could be regarded by someone looking to have dirt stick as crossing a line. And she did indeed say one thing, at least, that did cross the line, of the famous line to Henry Norris, the king's friend, you look for dead men's shoes, for if aught came to the king but good, you would look to have me, which is saying, you want to marry me when my husband's dead. And to imagine the death of the king in words, under the Treasons Act of 1534, is a treason itself, it's high treason. And this ultimately is what um, I think kills Anne, because it is um, conspiring the king's death, it is imagining the king's death, and that is what kills her. Um, so in the end, I think that there is a sufficient amount of dirt for it to stick to Anne. Um, we, could, we could spend a lot of time talking about how that dirt is dug up, um, mm -hmm. I'm sure Cromwell acts as the king's good servant in this. He acts on the king's orders, and that is, um, that is definitely uh, irrefutable in terms of the evidence we have. Henry, he's acting on Henry's orders. So it's very hard, I think, to sustain an idea that this is a court coup um, conjured up by Cromwell and take Henry out of it. We can't do that. I mean, I'm sure that one could do some sort of backbend, double twist, and try and say, well, that Cromwell could make Henry do things that Henry would then tell Cromwell to do, etc. <laughs> but sometimes you just have to go with Occam's razor, you know, the simplest explanation <laughs> is the most plausible. So I think Henry tells Cromwell to do it. Why he tells him appears to be on the basis of rumours that are spreading around about Anne. Um, and when Cromwell looks into it, he finds someone who confesses. He, this person confesses, um, and he confesses almost certainly under torture. There are three different accounts. One of them has recently been pretty quite roundly dismissed actually as not being, um, as being a forgery. So the two remaining accounts are, talk about different forms of torture. This is Mark, of Mark Smeaton, but basically Smeaton was probably tortured. And that kind of helps produce a confession. Oh, yeah. um, and, and the reason why uh, Cromwell is so desperate to get a confession out of Smeaton may lie in one line from a source from um, Lancelot de Carl, who's a secretary of the French ambassador. It's uncorroborated elsewhere, but in it he says that Cromwell was told by the king it was on uh, if it, the accusations turned out not to be true, it would be on pain of death for the person who brought the news to um, the king, which was Sir William Fitzwilliam, later um, Earl of Southampton, and Cromwell himself, and so you know, they find evidence. <laughs> yeah. And, and, uh, and the, the whole thing doesn't stack up. From my point of view, if you look at the, the, the records we have, you know, there's like, Anne is not doing these things, really. I mean, we, I can fairly categorically say Anne is not doing these things. Um, but Anne is muddying the waters by what she says enough to look like she could have been. And that's all that all that's necessary, really. Yeah, absolutely. She was vulnerable, wasn't she, to those charges? Like somebody like Catherine of Aragon could never have been. So yeah, yeah. 
yeah, that's up. right. I think just sitting in front of um, Thomas Cromwell would be enough to, to make me confess. I don't, oh God. Yeah. Like I, there's, yeah. you know, different points in, I've been looking at 1535 and there's different points there where Henry's kind of like, oh yeah, you know, that this is not verbatim, obviously I'm just uh, paraphrasing, but when he needs something done and he needs someone to tell the truth, oh, send Cromwell, Cromwell can do it type thing. So it's like, hmm, interesting. Yeah. yeah. All right, so Martin would like to know, do you think the executioner was ordered before Anne's trial on the 15th of May? Mm. Mm, that's interesting. Mm. So we know the executioner is there for the morning of the 19th of May. Um, the executioner comes from Calais. Uh, so if the executioner was ordered after the trial on the 15th of May, you've got to have a messenger to get to Calais and you've got to have the executioner travel back in that four day period. And really actually they've got to be there on the 18th for them to know they can go ahead on the 19th. Um, it's a very short period of time. It's perhaps, it, it's just possible, but it would depend on really good weather. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, May is not a bad time to get good weather to cross the channel, but that's what it really, brought, you know, that's what it boils down to. I think it's more likely it's ordered a, a week before Anne's execution. So on the 12th of May, you've got the trial of the men um, and they're found guilty of adultery. And obviously you need two to tango. So we know it's a sort of foregone conclusion what the results on the 15th of May are gonna be. And I, I imagine if it's ordered before the, the trial of the 15th of May, it's ordered, they're ordered, the order has taken place on the 12th. So maybe even before that, who knows? But um, a week seems, a more plausible least, yeah. Uh, interval yeah at least for to make that trip there and back you know yeah definitely because people could be stuck waiting to cross for, for weeks which is what happened to henry and anne didn't that when they were waiting for the yeah road. yeah henry and anne and then again and the other anne, anne of cleves of course is stuck for you know a few a few weeks as well like you know so it's yeah you could absolutely spend um you know 15 days waiting for the weather mm -hmm. to be right but it depends on the time of year and the other journeys we're thinking about are more wintry conditions than May. So, you know, <laughs> possible, but I, yeah. <laughs> unlike, I think it's unlikely that it's ordered on the 15th of May. So what I'd say. Okay. Thank you. So Rachel asks, was the swordsman from Calais proof that Henry loved Anne, which is what we sometimes hear a merciful act because the King knew she was innocent or simply an act of mercy for his former queen. Well, I don't think he thinks she's innocent. Let's knock that one out there. And um, and if you think someone's innocent, you don't demonstrate it by cutting their head off. Um, so, I mean, in my opinion. Um, uh, so, I mean, it is merciful. The, the truth of the matter is it is merciful. Um, for the, the, the obviously, so at the time that the, he had options to, uh, you know, either, have her executed by burning or beheading. Obviously, beheading is more is more merciful than burning. Um, uh, beheading, however, is not a Tudor executioner speciality. It's not that commonly done in England. Um, most hanging, uh, um, sorry, most executions are by hanging by British executioners. So they haven't got a lot of practice um, when it comes to swinging swinging an axe and. And we see this repeatedly throughout the Tudor period, Cromwell, uh, Margaret Poole, uh, where you know the, the executioner buggers it up really and has to have another go. So, um, so Tudor executioners were not famed for their skill in beheading people. So it it was an act of mercy for sure to order the French executioner who had a lot, you know, had a practice and knew how to swing a sword that would give a nice clean cut. Um, whether it's something that Henry orders or whether it's something that Anne herself requests, Eric Ives suggests that possibility. And that seems, I think that might be plausible. I mean, Anne may well have seen an execution while she was in France. Maybe she asked for it, um, but we don't have any evidence either way, I'm afraid. So um, all, all I can say is it is merciful, um, but there's a limit to that mercy. You know, she's still gonna die in the end. So, yeah. Yeah, and you only need to, I think, as you say, read those accounts of people executed with axes. It's not a pleasant um, business at all. No. Um, Jessica would like to know whether Anne was blindfolded on the scaffold. She was, according to the accounts, yes. At the very end, um, uh, once she had, you know, prepared, taken off um, the various 
garments and uh, put her hair up under a little cap or coif, um, she then was blindfolded by some of her ladies. Yes, that's what the um, that's what the accounts that we have say. Yeah, I think the sight of the eyes might have been a bit much for anybody, really. Oh, yeah. Gosh. Um, multiple people were actually interested in whether coffins were pro provided for Anna and the men as well that were executed a couple of days before. And, and also, if not, if they weren't provided, why weren't they provided? Yeah, I don't, I, off the top of my head, I actually don't know about the coffins for the men. For Anne, we know it's not really a coffin. There's a, a chest of elm wood that had been set aside to be used for, um, or had been used for uh, bow staves. Um, uh, and Anne is put in that. Um, and she's stripped to, to go in that, incidentally. Like, they take all her fine clothes off her. Well, ladies are doing this, so it's slightly less awful than one might want to think. But still, still. Um, uh, so she is buried in that. Um, do you know, Natalie, off the top of your head about the men? I don't know about the I coffins. actually don't think they were coffins provided for them either. No, I don't think. I would need to. Yeah. Yeah, I'd need to check as well. I mean, my my in I don't think I've ever read anything about coffins, which is so mm. I'm thinking unless yeah. So I don't want to argue from absence of memory or absence of evidence here, but my yeah, my instinct is that there weren't coffins and that they're just the, that they're buried in graves in pairs, aren't they? So I don't think they are in coffins. Um, um but with Anne is in the kind of substitute for one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's a good point that you you raise about her being um stripped of her clothing because I have seen recently some things going around saying that she was buried in her clothes and and we know that she wasn't because there was a payment made um mm -hmm. in lieu of that because the king wanted it all back so yeah unfortunately yeah she probably do you think she may have been I think maybe just covered with the linen that's mentioned in one of the yeah things? I mean I imagine I imagine when we said we like I imagine the the Tudor word naked would mean in a linen, in a linen uh, shift or something. it wouldn't mean absolutely stark as, <laughs> um, sorry, I shouldn't laugh about it, but I'm like, you know, the, the, but for the Tudor, but the Tudor, you know, and probably in her coif as well, what is going to be taken off her was the rich fabrics. That's yeah. what would have served as a payment. A linen smock is not worth anything. No, no, absolutely. Um, okay, so Lucy, Lucy would like to know what trial records exist. Very good question, mm -hmm. Lucy. And which of the charges laid against Anne and the men accused alongside her, and again, you've kind of touched on this too, were punishable by death? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So the trial records, a lot of the trial records don't exist, which is where our problems start. One of the places. Anyway, um, so we have an indictment, um, long, beautiful document in Latin at the National Archives, um, which lays out the charges against Anne and against the men. Um, so it talks about things like Anne, um, uh, you know, in, uh, inciting these men to, to provoking them to, to carnally um, know her or, you know, and, and putting her tongue in, you know, the said George Boleyn's mouth and his tongue in hers and that sort of thing. It's all very levitious um, and it's filled with uh, dates of time, dates these things took place and places where they took place. Um, and in a great piece of detective work, Eric Ives disproved 75% of these that you could say, okay, you know, the, but the court wasn't there on that day. So they're, they're plucked out of a hat, you know, they're made up evidence. Um, because they don't really have to stick, they just have to create the impression of something, you know, no one's actually going to do the due diligence on this because the time frame for uh, at the investigation is so short. I mean, it, it, within three weeks, it passes through. So um, less than that, really, if we're just going up to the 15th of May from yeah. the day that Anne is rested on the 2nd of May through to the 15th of May. I mean, you know, it's less than two weeks. There's just not time for a proper investigation. So these are just made up. Um, and in terms of the charges, yeah, so adultery, uh, by a, a queen is not a capital offence. Rape of a queen is a capital offence, but there's a problem if she appears to have consented um, in that it's not. Um, also, incest is not a capital offence. The only thing that's a capital offence is this charge of conspiring the king's death, and that's only a capital offence under the 1534 Treasons Act. When Catherine Howard is later accused um, and executed on the same on the same charge, really, you know, of adultery in this case. Um, 
then the it has to be created in law and it's created in law in the same act of attainder the act passed through parliament that declares her guilt um is the same one that creates this as a crime you know so um so it's not actually she's anne boleyn is does not die because of adultery she died uh, at least in legal terms yeah. um uh, so in legal terms she's killed because of her treason yes her treason and there were there was mention in there wasn't there susanna of um her laughing at henry's songs was it his song yeah yeah at oh, his God. at his poetry yeah and his manner of dress um and then that charge about uh, her telling her brother that he, you know the king was not good in bed yeah, um, that's really which was deeply, about deeply shameful. Yeah. Revealing about Henry, um, and uh, possibly, I mean, yeah, re revealing about Henry, and I think it's absolutely, it's obviously true, right? It's obviously true. Yes, so it, it happens later, you know. It's not, it's not, um, no, we're not, not good in bed. I and mean, he's imp impotent. It's not a sort of a judgment, really. But he, he um, but also. Um, it shows something of i mean henry's a deep is deeply romantic man but he's not he's not this sort of great lothario that we we think of him as he's just not you know yeah oh yeah all right Janelle. sorry if i didn't pronounce that correctly janelle maybe why do you think henry was so forgiving of the howard male leadership for his failed boleyn slash catherine howard marriages why were they not blamed or why was the duke of norfolk really never blamed I think it's because at the heart of it, um, Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard are accused of female crimes. Yeah. You know, they're accused of uh, betraying Henry in a way that only a woman could. And it reminds me of a letter that Henry wrote um, in uh, 1540. So yeah, after the, um, when his, marriage to Anne of Cleves was being dismantled. He wrote a letter about, it was just trying to ensure that Anne of Cleves didn't renege on any of the things promised. And he talks about how um, uncertain a woman's promises. Um, and he says this bit about how, um, you know, the only th way you could be certain of, of her is if she would um, change her womanish nature, which is impossible. Um, and uh, like I, I thought it was really interesting because there you've got the sort of hot, Henry is of you know obviously a misogynist right so mm -hmm. he he obviously he obviously doesn't think that um, women are trustworthy in any way and maybe one could argue by 1540 he feels like he's had evidence of it um mm -hmm. although it's pre-Catherine Howard um yes <laughs> but I think I think ultimately he has come to believe he, in both cases Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard have done something that is a female crime and obviously they're you know they're, they're their family members cannot be held responsible for it. And um, Thomas Boleyn also doesn't particularly suffer as a result, I mean, you know, of Anne's crimes. Um, so it's because what they do, only a woman could do. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, Rebecca would like to know, do you think Anne was a woman ahead of her time? We kind of hear this a lot that she was, you know, sometimes even labeled a feminist, a woman ahead of her time. What do you think? I really would like to ask Rebecca more about <laughs> in what ways she in thinks she was and you know um because there's so many ways one could tackle this and I mean obviously in some ways in I, I mean I believe that she was um uh, a woman who, in, who inclined towards the new learning the evangelical the proto-protestant um faith and so in that way she certainly was a little ahead of her time in that she's embracing a faith that by the end of the 16th century is much more commonly accepted than it is at the beginning. Um, she obviously is also a woman who's very strong-willed um, and um, is someone who speaks up for herself um, and she is, as I mentioned earlier, charismatic um, and persuasive. Mm. But to be perfectly frank, I think those are just qualities that women have had throughout time some women you know i don't think that particularly makes her uh ahead of her time in more like us when i've worked on uh, what we know about other women you know i did i've written a book recently about women in france and in the 16th century early 17th centuries 
and these are ordinary women, they're women of not the same sort of status as Anne, but they're constantly vocal and persuasive and aggressive and uh, determined and out to get what they want. And so I think Anne is a woman of her time in that regard or of all time, you know. Um, I, I think the women's nature hasn't necessarily changed that much, even if their access to opportunities has differed greatly over time. Yeah, yeah, that's a great answer. Thank you. And Summer would like to ask you, the show The Tudors suggests that Sir William Compton had a sexual relationship with Thomas Tallis and that George Boleyn had a relationship with Mark Smeaton. Is there any truth to this as far as you know, Susanna? Uh, the simple answer is no. Um, <laughs> the, there's no evidence at all um, to suggest it. Um, and actually there's some difficulties, like Compton dies in 1528. Yeah. Um, Thomas Tallis, we don't know exactly when he was born. We think he was born about 1505. He, oh, the first appointment that he has um, that we know of is from 1530. Um, and uh, he's down in Kent. Um, he doesn't come to the court until, as far as we know, until 1540s, 43, I think it is. So basically Compton and Tallis probably didn't meet. <laughs> That's the short answer there. Um, and where, and there's just not really, I mean, I think the George Berlin, Mark Smeaton thing, I think it, the sexual relationship between them, I think it came from Philippa Gregory's mind in the first place, actually. I don't, I don't think it, I, as far as I'm aware, there's not a shred of primary source evidence to back it up. Thank you. Anthony would like to know, if Henry had died in the jousting accident he had in early 1536, how do you think Anne's life might have unfolded? It would have depended if she had still miscarried a few days later. Uh, presumably she would have done because she said that she, I mean, she said she miscarried at the shop of the king's hall. Who knows one, why one miscarries? Um, um, if she hadn't, of course, and had gone on to bear a son because the boy it was considered to be a boy from what they could tell at 15 weeks. Um, then she, her life would have been um, absolutely fine. <laughs> she would have been the mother of, uh, the, of the, the, the king. She would have been a regent mother um, and uh, would have probably held a lot of power. But it probably more likely she would have miscarried. And then who knows what would have happened? I mean, would she have been married again? Like quite common as a widow to marry again. I think she probably would have been. I mean, obviously, there's options for convents and that sort of thing. And obviously, if Henry had died, the monasteries may well not have been dissolved. The convents yeah. may have carried on. Um, but I imagine Anne would have... I don't think that was necessarily Anne's... Who knows? She was both a woman of great vitality and um, vivacity and a woman of faith, you know. Mm. So who knows what she would have preferred. Mm. Um, but basically, life would have been a lot better <laughs> in the long term it sounds that way yeah definitely now this is an interesting one Susanna Lorraine would like to know do you think Jane felt any guilt over Anne's death we don't have any evidence that she felt any guilt um if you feel guilt um to have a dispensation for you to marry issued on the day that your rival dies mm -hmm. to get betrothed the next day and to marry 10 days later is a very strange way to go about showing it um, no, she doesn't appear to have demonstrated any remorse. I mean, she's practically stepping over Anne's head, isn't she, as she trips down the aisle. So, um, who knows, maybe she felt just as a later stage. I, mean, I, I, I really struggle with Jane, actually. She's the, one, she's the only one of the wives that I find it really hard to be sympathetic towards. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work on that, but, uh, like, I, yeah, I, I, I don't think there's any evidence of that. I like that you're trying to work on that. I'm trying, I'm trying to work on that too. Maybe we can work on it together. <laughs> so Emma asks, if Anne had been a foreign bride, do you think Henry would have been able to rid himself of her as he did? He would have been able to rid himself of her. He managed to rid himself of two other foreign brides, of course. Um, but probably not as he did. Um, so if she had, if Anne had had, relations like Charles V, as Catherine of Aragon did, or even the much less important, but still relatively important Duke William, um, the, uh, you know, uh, Anne's, uh, of um, Cleves, Anne's brother, Anne of Cleves' brother, um, they're, you know, they're, they're still powerful enough enemies for you not want to go, you know, to execute their aunt or sister. So 
I don't think she could have been executed, but I think she could have been put aside. Um, and I think that is probably what would have happened to her, that she would have lived out a life, like, probably in a convent, or if she refused to go to a convent, as Catherine of Aragon did, um, you know, in some accommodation somewhere, her still insisting that she was the king's wife, him still marrying on. Um, but I don't think that he would have done something um, quite so severe that would have led, would have endangered his throne to such a degree. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And, and Martha asks you whether, if Anne had had the son, while Henry was alive obviously still do you think he would have tired of her or would his love have turned to you know that kind of hate that you were talking about before or what do you think would have happened there yeah so to be clear i think the hate came after he thought she was guilty of adultery i don't think that he i don't buy um i just don't feel like there's any evidence i mean i'm going to look at it again or very soon but i just don't feel like there's evidence to sustain a drop off in his affection. I just, I don't find it. I don't find, I don't understand how historians, have, anyway, so I don't have, see, have, see it in there. Um, so I don't see a drop off of affection for her. That doesn't mean he's not flirting with other people. It doesn't mean that he's not thinking about taking mistresses, mm -hmm. but that he, I don't think those two things are incompatible in Henry's mind, especially when Anne is indisposed as she would have been after a miscarriage or during a pregnancy. Um, I think that um, I think that the affection continues. So, sorry to the question: If she he, she had a son, um, so I imagine that would have helped her stay riding pretty high um, in Henry's affection. Frankly, um, uh, Jane Seymour obviously does die very soon after giving birth to a son, but then she's sort of blessed Jane of you know um, extraordinary you know you know of of Henry's memory who can never do anything wrong. And I mean, it's obviously harder to sustain such a reputation if you actually carry on living yes. and might mess up. But um, I think that having a son would have probably secured Anne's position for sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So Elise um, wants to know whether you think the memorial at the Tower of London is sufficient to properly address the contribution that Anne made to the Tudor period and to wider British history. Mm. So it was put in in 2006, it's by an artist called Brian Catling, and um, it was definite improvement to what was there before, which was just a small plaque. Um, and it's made to commemorate Anne, but also a number of other people who died within the tower. Uh, and it's designed to, if you haven't seen it, it's this kind of glass uh, cushion, I suppose. Um, and then there's two glass circles underneath it. And it's designed for you to walk around it and read the verse that's inscribed on it, the names that are inscribed on it as well. Um, it's an art installation. It's a sort of visual um, art installation. And um, historically speaking, I find it a bit difficult because it, the cushion thing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Like, um, I just, you know, this is not how, this is not where Anne's head it was conveyed on a cushion to the tower or, you know, to the St. Peter of Divincula or anything like that. I just, so, um, historically speaking, I, I don't find it very, a very helpful um, intervention in the space. And I think that there could be something else that helped people um, recall that moment uh, in a better way but it's hard to do it you know it's hard to do it in a way that um is sensitive and maintains dignity you know i you know i don't want to see some sort of hammy um, reconstruction of a scaffolding and historic royal palaces would never put that in so how does one do it it's a really interesting question and and it's not the only person who dies there and that's the other thing to reckon to recognize that other people's lives um have just as great um an importance as hers um, and they too died there. So I can see why people might not feel happy with it as a memorial, but I, I, it's an interesting question about what one would do alternatively. And I think it's important to remember that it was always intended to be an artist's reflection on it, on the moment, rather than um, this is, you know, a piece of interpretation telling you about the history exactly. Yeah, yeah, excellent. It's a beautiful poem though, isn't it? The one that's written. It's a beautiful out. poem. Yeah, yeah, that's Very right, yeah. Very moody. Uh, so Lorraine wants to know if we know what happened to Anne's famous pearl necklace. The truth of the matter is we don't. So I'm assuming Lorraine is talking about the bee. The bee. Um, there's like there's, com there's um, some um, evidence that she may have had more than one with different initials, her initials, different variations of her initials. Um, and some people have suggested that Elizabeth is wearing 
um, an A for Anne in the family of Henry VIII's picture of 1545. So whether it is actually that, I'm, I'm not entirely convinced. But the, see, bec the reason I'm not convinced is this, because um, Anne's jewellery became the property of the king yeah. because she committed treason. Everything she owned became the property of the king. And Henry was already pretty awful <laughs> from that point. Right? I mean, he was pretty like shameless about passing on jewellery from one queen to the next. Um, you know, the queen's jewels would move on to each of the yeah. queens. So um, I imagine that the jewels of that, you know, pearls of that size, it would have just been reworked into a new piece of jewellery, I think. Mm. Um, so that's sort of why I doubt um, I, if the if and if Elizabeth is indeed wearing an A, um, it's probably a, a, a piece of jewellery of her own. It, it may not even be that. I think it may even be some way of um, remembering the cross. Um, but I might be wrong about that. Who knows? But um, but I think Anne's pearls probably just made up other pieces of jewellery that were worn by other queens after that point. Yeah, probably something on Jane Seymour's neck after that. I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. And and thereafter on all the others, yeah. Thereafter, yeah. Was it even interesting that even their private, well, private sort of jewelry gifts given by the king were also because we see that with Catherine Parr, where she's thinking she's going to hang on to some things, and they're like, no, no, they're the queen's jewels. So it's quite interesting with the jewelry, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So she, yeah, and she's allowed a certain amount of things that she's allowed to hang on to in his, in his will. But yeah, there are certain um, designated jewels that you know belong to the crown, effectively. Yeah, that's right. Okay, we're getting there, Susanna. I hope you're not getting too sleepy <laughs> there. You're doing so well. Yeah, okay. yeah, we're, we're, we're late. <laughs> you're good, you're good. Aisha, sorry again if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Aisha would love to know what Dr. Lipscomb's thoughts are on the resurgence of younger generations being interested in Anne's history and all of Henry's Queens through popular media like, for example, Six the Musical, even though it takes yeah. a bit of poetic license, of course. Yeah, I saw it. It's brilliant. <laughs> it is good. It's good. Um, it's really good. And actually, it's also written by someone who really knows the history, even though they've chosen to depart from it. Like you, wow. there's a lot of jokes in there that if you know the history, you, you only find them funny because you know the history. So like it just is. Um, uh, so it's an interesting kind of postmodern take, I suppose. Um, I mean, I, you know, I think a rising tide lifts all boats. I mean, I think anything that gets people interested in history is great and um, I think having a sort of funky new interpretation of the wives um, the, in it's, you know, it's a brilliant musical I think uh, although I mean I would say I disagree with some of the I mean some of them I think are brilliant and some of the perspectives on the wives I think aren't I aren't brilliant I like I don't think you know I'm not a big fan of their interpretation of Anne Boleyn for example yeah. but um, uh, whereas I think Catherine Howard is much better done but um, that doesn't matter. The point is that it interests people in the history and it gets them going back to the books and thinking about these people as real people. And I think so often for people who you know, have been dead 500 years, it, it, you know, we can start to lose a sense of their humanity and something like this makes you think, oh no, these were just, these were just yeah. women. These were just ordinary women. And actually most of them died, well, nearly all, they all died, um, uh, you know, young. So... Catherine of Aragon is the longest of all. You know, the others are all um, dead before they hit 45. So, um, you know, it's the, they're mostly young women, um, even if they were older by the standards of the time. And they are, um, and women, you know, we want to get people engaging with their stories. That's it, really. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I find so many people have come to to research and write about the Tudors through things like the Tudors, the show, and despite all that, the inaccuracies or whatever, and, and, and historical fiction, I think, is a great gateway into yeah. um, further study, isn't it? So it's great. Yeah, yeah. My, my friend Dan Jones calls it a gateway drug. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a Dan Jones thing to say, Susanna. Yeah. Um, so this is our lucky last question. So. It's about the roses that get sent every year. And this, again, is just, there were multiple people asking about this, actually. And I've heard different things. So I'm interested in hearing what you think. Who do you think sends these roses to the tower on the anniversary of Anne's execution every year? Uh, you know, I'm, it's, it's like, I have a slightly disappointingly cynical answer to this, which is, I sort of wonder if the tower itself organises them, Someone you know? Said that like, and I was like, oh no, please. Yeah, but that's okay. Like, like, but you know, 
so um, for, I hope my father doesn't watch this, so for years, um, so for years my, my father would receive, sorry, excuse this personal anecdote, but for years my father would receive a Valentine's card um, with a gorilla on it, which my mother hadn't sent. And then one year it didn't come. And so from the next year onwards, my mother, apart from her Valentine's card, would send him this card with a, with a gorilla on so that he continued to think he had this admirer, um, exter you know, to, and that was, um, and I, so the, the reason I think of that is I think, I'm sure at some point there was someone else who sent the roses, <laughs> but I now wonder if it's become like, the, that there are roses that arrive for Anne and always, you know, always, has become something that needs to be maintained, like, you know, <laughs> as a sort of fiction almost. Like, so that I think there will always be roses and someone will make sure they're there and maybe it's almost on someone's to-do list at the tower, who knows. But, and I don't, but I think it's okay. I don't think mm. it takes away from the romance of it because at some point the tradition was started and now it seems important enough to keep up, you know? Yeah. And we should and have I hope my father never anyway. knows. hope he never watches that and finds out about the gorillas. <laughs> Oh my god that's firstly like, that's such a cute story i love that i think that's beautiful of your mom to do that and with the roses there are others aren't there so it's not the only one like that's a sort of basket of roses but people actually yeah. go i've been myself yeah. and, you know like yeah. it's a beautiful thing to do isn't it yeah it is and people you know and uh, uh you know so there is a sort of homage paid you know mm -hmm. homage paid to Anne um by people coming from all over the world so mm -hmm. it's not like um, so even if it is this ploy, um, I think that actually we we know that we know that the tide of sentiment towards Anne is great. You know? Absolutely. Well, before I can let you go, Suzanne, I want to know what's happening with you. What's next? What's on the Tudor list for you? Well, <laughs> well, what is? <laughs> I mean, hopefully this will be of interest to your uh, watch your viewers because what I'm actually doing is I am writing about Henry VIII's <laughs> queens. Um, um, for what it's worth, I just feel like obviously there were these um, 1991 we had Alison Weir's book, mm -hmm. 92 uh, uh, Antonio Fraser, David Starkey at the turn of the century and there have been since then there have been there's been so much new research, yeah. um, so many biographies of the wives, so much uncovered in terms of new documentation um, and when one looks, well a couple of different things, um, when one looks back at the collective biographies of the wives, brilliant though they are, some of their interpretations are what we might call um, uh, dated. You know, they don't, uh, and, and particularly in terms of, from thinking from a feminist perspective, I mean, qu quite a lot of the judgments on these women are one that we just can't really, I can't really stomach actually in the 21st century. And I don't think it's okay, you know, to talk about Anne being successful because of her, you know, her, her unwomanliness or um, to talk about Catherine Howard as a natural tart or like promiscuous or this, like there are the, the words used about many of the wives or, or, you know, some of them not having an idea in her head, you know, a pretty little head, just like language that I find disturbing. Yeah. And, um, and belittling and doesn't capture, it's, you know, it's, it's misogynistic basically. It doesn't capture who these women were. Um, so that's one reason I want to do it. Um, the other thing is, as I say, about the sort of great wealth of research that's emerged. And finally, um, because a lot of the work that's done on the wives um, relies really heavily on the calendared um, documents of the period. So for those who aren't aware, uh, familiar with the primary sources uh, brilliantly in the 19th century the state papers of Henry VIII's reign were put in chronological order I, that's where the word calendar comes from um, and dated and summarized in these things called the letters and papers and so for the reign of Henry VIII there are 21 volumes of these sometimes um, breaking into um, uh, multiple parts um, and so people tend to refer to these letters and papers and they are brilliant, right? It's, you know, it's an amazing resource that we have and they're printed. Um, but it's not always okay to rely on them. Um, it, you know, quite often they are summarizing a document rather than yes. um, yeah. transcribing it and they are rendering it in the third person rather than the first person. And when you go back to the first person letters, the, they're vividly thrilling because they you know, seem so much more direct. 
Um, now, obviously, COVID-19 has thrown a little bit of a, a, a you know, a spanner in the works and getting to archives and things at the moment. But as far as it's possible, I'm trying to go back to original sources. Um, and sometimes that means, you know, if I'm working from French ambassadors' letters, I'm reading the original letters and, you know, the translations that are used a lot sometimes I feel like I'm okay I'm not sure that that nuance is the mm. right one you know yeah. so it, I think so it, I, it gives a chance to to give to scrape off some of the ways that we've understood them and see it see them afresh yeah oh I'm so looking forward to it I think you're going to do a fantastic job with it and oh, I know you're going to do a fantastic job with oh, it I hope so it's a it's a big it's a I mean it's a it's Indeed. a daunting task it's a daunting task but I'm doing my best yeah with your little one as well that's a big project but I do you have any sort of um end date in mind just when you would like to have yeah. it. so we're, we've the, the publisher and i have been discussing it because because everything's you know been put back in the entire world isn't it yeah. so um so i'm hoping to complete it for a, in with early next year um and then it would hopefully come out in early 2022 so it was going to be coming out before that but we've set it back a bit just hoping that I get time to get to the manus to manuscripts and more of the archives and things so that's that's the current timetable I'm probably in trouble telling you that but at the moment it's I spring you. too <laughs> and so. oh I'm so looking forward to it that's wonderful and thank you so much for taking the time to to talk with me and talk all things Berlin it's been fantastic and I know everyone's going to enjoy your responses so much they're always you're always so thoughtful and and well spoken and I, I just enjoy speaking to you so much so oh, thank, thank you that's very kind Natalie thank you for asking me on it's been great to see you thank you so much and i'll be in touch soon so take care okay take care bye bye, bye, -bye.